Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the second part of our mini series on art in East and Southeast Asia. Um, it gives me great pleasure to see you, so many of you, back here again. And of course, to welcome our two speakers tonight, tonight in Hong Kong, in the early morning for the first speaker, in fact, Nora Taylor, um, who is <clears throat> the Alsdorf Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art History at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. She previously taught at UCLA and also much closer to Southeast Asia at NUS and NTU in Singapore. She works on Vietnamese art and has written one very important publication, Painters in Hanoi. Um, today, she will be speaking on Kissinger's Letters in an Art Museum, Dunmore's Historical Provocations on Display at the Guggenheim. Nora, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Uh, thank you for organizing this um, uh, wonderful event. Um, I wish I were in Hong Kong myself. <laughs> um, so let me start. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. So contained in boxes for all eternity, ancient and precious artifacts housed in museum vitrines are subject to scrutiny, interpretation, and transformation in the process of being exhibited. Encased in a box, yet exposed to the world, fetishized, revered, or vilified as evidence of archeological raids, they're endowed with prestige and aura. Like relics, art pilgrims see them as embodiments of the essence and quality of a deceased person. They become activated as visitors engage and commune with them in an effort to remember what they represent. They serve as personifications of ideas that are made visible through objectification. They're also reminders that objects journey from their place of origin to a shop, a collection, a gallery before they make their way into the museum as often is the case, their final resting place. The journey has elevated their status and the further they have traveled geographically, historically, and symbolically, the greater the value they acquire. In an effort to understand how historical objects displayed in a museum shift from the mundane to the sublime, I propose to examine the recent solo ex retrospective of works by the Danish Vietnamese artist Jan Va at the Guggenheim Museum in New York um, that will open, that, sorry, um, that had op opened in Copenhagen a few uh, years later. Uh, Jan Va's exhibition contains a rich trove of historical and personal material acquired, collected, and curated by the artist, mined at auction houses, harvested from family members, or found in demolished churches in Vietnam. What interests me is the ontological shift that takes place when these artifacts are exhibited in an art museum and conversely, how the museum is altered by their presence. Why do these objects carry such potency? And what does it mean for a visual artist to display objects of historical value as works of art in a contemporary art museum? Jan Va, as he is known by his artist's name, was born Va Chu Kin Yan in today's uh, Baza Vung Tao province in 1975. As Catholics, like many other converts in South Vietnam, his family feared persecution by the newly instituted communist government and fled the country by boat. Drifting on the South China Sea, they were rescued by a Danish cargo ship who escorted them to a refugee camp in Singapore. As the artist retells it, when it came time to applying for asylum, his father asked to resettle in Denmark, believing in the good omen presented by their encounter at sea. In accordance with Danish immigration laws, Jan had to change his name to suit the local conventions of first name first and last name last, unlike Vietnamese that places the surname first. So Va Chu Ki Yan became Chunki Yan Va, a humorous substitute in the artist's uh, opinion since in the artist's opinion, sorry, since Chung, meaning middle, was also the middle name of his siblings. He shortened his name to Yan Va, dropping the Chung Ki portion. Playing with his name became a later project of his, as in order to challenge 
heteronormative marital conventions of adopting one's spouse's name, as a gay man, he married close female friends and added their names legally to his becoming Janval Roskasko Rasmussen. The 2003 marriage certificate hung on the wall of the Guggenheim as both artifact and performance remain. An official document turned into a work of art, a prelude to his work to come. Jan Vaal studied art at the, Danish, uh, the Royal Danish Academy of Art before moving to Frankfurt to study at the Städelschule. Early in his career, Vaal found himself drawn to his family's story and mined his parents' possessions as a source of his art practice. This included staging an exhibition in his parents' apartment in the suburbs of Copenhagen in 2006 and creating a sculpture out of the items that were given to his grandmother when she arrived in Germany as a refugee. The resulting work that he titled Oma Totem superimposed a television set on top of a refrigerator, on top of a washing machine and adorned with a cross. These ordinary household appliances were transformed into a shrine, a homage to the artist's grandmother. But once in the museum, they ceased to become either ordinary or personal. They became part of the artist of, viewed as an act of creation by an artist and examined for their aesthetic qualities or possible hidden meaning. They take on a relationship with an audience within the context of an art institution. In the Guggenheim's open spiral atrium, viewers approach the work like they would any other modernist sculpture, save its components seem to bear more gravitas against the white walls and marble floors like discarded commodities after a house renovation or those in transit between homes, an eerie emblem of the dehumanized process of relocation. As Vaugh's work evolved, his excavation of family heirlooms became more poignant and increasingly emblematic of their history of departure and resettlement. Yet the artist shies away from revealing too much about his past and never touches on the subject of identity politics. His process of choosing objects for his works straddle the personal with the political, or as he stated in the exhibition catalog for the Guggenheim exhibition, his story is not a singular thing. It weaves in and out of other people's private stories of local and geopolitical history. In 2009, in a work that he titled, If You Were to Climb the Himalayas Tomorrow, he took three objects previously owned by his father, an American military signet ring, a Rolex watch that his father had purchased with gold that he had left over from his flight out of Vietnam, and the DuPont lighter that he purchased from the first profits he made after arriving in Denmark. Vaal convinced his father to give them up with an offer to replace them with more contemporary versions. The objects are presented in, uh, or were presented, sorry, in a wall set between they conjures luxury retail display and take on a preciousness that should the viewers not be aware of their context would, would appear as symbols of wealth. In the Guggenheim, the watch and the lighter shone behind glass cases in a setting that would be at ease be, beside Joseph Cornell and Marcel Duchamp's boxes made of found objects. But the artist is much more interested in what the objects mean, meant to his father. And I quote, they are manifestations of desires from the time that my father was in Vietnam, end quote. According to him, these items ossify a set of fiercely patriarchal cultural values that are attached to them. The idea of masculinity and power, time, fire, and war. In 2009, Bob began to look beyond the confines of his family's micro history and acquired three large chandeliers that hung, hung above the tables where the Paris peace accords were signed in the Hotel Majestic in 1973. How these grandiose decorative lighting fixtures came into his possession is not immediately discernible. Always interested in his country's history, the chandeliers drew his attention when he came across the photograph of the signing of the treaty in a contemporaneous edition of the New York Times and immediately took an interest in the disproportionately large object, uh, glass object looming over the table. Upon further investigation, he discovered that the building had recently been sold and would be subject to a comprehensive renovation. 
He initiated a complex chain of negotiations for the chandeliers, eventually purchasing all three and creating three separate, separate sculptures with each titled according to the time and day that they were extracted from the ceiling. He kept two more or less intact and dismantled the third, showing it in exhibitions disassembled in pieces, laid out like a skeleton or the remains of a fossilized dinosaur. These chandeliers are typical objects of choice for Baugh. They are glamorous and luxurious and associated with masculinity, war, and death. More importantly, they stand as witnesses to history. He recounted when he took his father to view the chandeliers before they were removed from the hotel, his father remarked that they must be like the ones hanging in the Danish royal palace and wondered how objects of such beauty could have stood at the site of betrayal. He says, his father's remarks nearly anthropomorphize them. By calling them witnesses, he has given them eyes and agency in the loss of his country. They bore testimony to the act that sealed the fate of millions of South Vietnamese. Although inanimate glass and steel, they became actors in a historic event by association, by their presence at the same moment and place. As objects, chandeliers are heavy, unwieldy items to hold. As emitters and reflectors of light, they're intended to be viewed from a distance. Hanging from a ceiling above those standing on the floor, they're rarely seen at eye level. They were first exhibited at the Kunsthaler Basel, dangling beneath a skylight at the center of the main gallery space. At the Guggenheim, they were hung from the short ceiling of one of the winding spaces near the ramp, raised only slightly above the tilted floor, offering viewers a close look at its armature, the nuts and bolts of its structure, looking even more like a body of flesh and bone. And lowering them to a human level, he has demoted them, brought them down from their lofty abode, secularized them, made them more human, but also brought them to justice to reckon with their treacherous past. The Guggenheim survey remark remarkably has included all three chandeliers. One of them is placed standing upright in a wooden crate as if to, ready to be shipped, only dismembered fragmented like other pieces of sculpture that are part of his repertoire. The exhibition that spanned his entire artistic career includes other such wooden boxes as well as pieces of luggage placed on the floor like discarded belongings. They contain portions of sculptures sawed down by the artist to fit the dimensions of a case or a valise. These interventions seem violent and vaguely fetishizing like a serial killer trying to hide the evidence of mutilated body parts. Many of the religious statues that he has mutilated come from French or Italian churches. Those he has kept intact are the wooden carvings from Vietnam. These remains can be likened to relics, body parts that stand in for the essence of an event or a human being. They're also provocations to museum goers more familiar with the sacro sanctification of antiques left untouched or handled with white gloves by curators and presented to viewers in glass receptacles. Baugh's acts of torture are echoed in other images on view, replicas of the gory scenes of brutal treatment of conquistadors, missionaries, or colonists in Asia and Latin America. In placing these objects in the museum, the artist is pointing directly at the institutions that have also contributed to the pillaging of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, robbing civilizations of their treasures for the sake of power. Baugh's method of encasing objects is a way of encapsulating a historical event by the means in which most people experience historical events without realizing what they are, nor how they got there via the museum. Ball's goal is to conceal the event in plain sight, so to speak, by displaying the historical trace as an artifact. Among the more powerful historic objects in his possessions are letters written by Henry Kissinger on White House sta stationery. Like the Rolex watch and DuPont lighter, the letters are set, were set in a backlit vitrine the artist acquired 14 letters addressed to Leonard Lyons and dated between 1969 and 1973. 
Lyons was a theater critic for the New York Post. During Henry Kissinger's years as Secretary of State for the Nixon administration, Lyons sent him theater tickets. The letters that Vaugh acquired are the thank you notes that Kissinger wrote to his benefactor. Typed onto White House stationery, these seemingly banal notes of gratitude carry heavy baggage for the less than casual reader. They contain confluences of references that are shockingly mundane for such weighty matters. Any reader familiar with the May 1970 shootings at Kent State University, in which students died at the hands of members of the Ohio, Ohio National Guard, would reel at one of the letter's references to the bombing of Cambodia within days of the campus crackdown. So the letter on the left says May 20th, so shortly after the Kent State shooting. What Vaughn doesn't say explicitly, his objects say implicitly. When Kissinger writes to Leonard Lyons that he would choose ballet over contemplation of Cambodia any day and, quote, keep tempting me, one day perhaps I will succumb, end quote, he's implying that the bombing of Cambodia is equal to ballet in his registry, with Cambodia winning over ballet at that given moment. The tone of the letter is also vaguely flirtatious with the phrase, keep tempting me. That Kissinger would drop a mention of the war and a thank you note also says much about his lack of empathy for the thousands of soldiers and civilians dying. The war is simply another annoyance to him, but it shows that everything that Kissinger touched was affected by the war and the piece of paper that Vaughn acquired is tainted by it. Textual, textual Analysis aside, the letters are also objectified in the way that the artists frame them. Although they're not precious artifacts in themselves, mere ink on paper and thank you notes from Leonard Lyons, for, yeah, from Leonard Lyons, they're made valuable by Kissinger's signature because of their association with the Secretary of State when he was heading the war in Vietnam. Like the chandeliers, their power lies in their proximity to a decisive moment in history. They can also be seen as relics, fractions of Kissinger's essence. Remnants of the war appear in multiple disguises in the exhibition, some intact like letters, some tainted by the artist like the chandeliers. There are also chairs that belong to John F. Kennedy, gifted to Robert McNamara, gutted of their upholstered insides, dismembered of their legs and stripped of their skins. These interventions may be, reveal strong sentiments on the part of the artist at the mere sight of an object connected to the decisions made about his family and his country. Enshrining these objects in the museum are perhaps meant to provoke an emotional reaction in viewers as well. While some viewers at the Guggenheim may have no connection to Vietnam or the war, some may have vivid memories of the events to which the objects allude. The narrative content connect, contained within the objects may not be substantial enough to provide a comprehensive history lesson to the viewers not familiar with the Vietnam War, but the traces of the past are present and evident for those in the know. An art museum may not be the most favorable place to trigger memories of the past, but if they were not on display for others to view, if they were sitting in a drawer or an attic, they would not engage with public memory in the same way. I'm reminded of a 2006 exhibition held at the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology in Hanoi that drew the largest numbers of visitors of any exhibition in Vietnamese museum history. The exhibition Thoi Bao Cup, or the subsidy period, consisted of household objects, trinkets, makeshift necessities, food rations, uh, coupons and other material documents pertaining to life after war when the country's economy was at the lowest. To furnish the exhibition, the museum curators had put out a call to the public to contribute any items that they may have saved from that era. It was, according to Ken McLean, an exceptional event for many reasons. Besides its popularity and attendance, it was an ex exhibition that focused on the lives of ordinary people unlike other kinds of exhibitions in Vietnam that either glorify the state or highlight the, highlight the achievements of extraordinary artists, writers, or national heroes. By virtue of holding an exhibition of artifacts that were 
in the possession of an impacted ordinary citizens in the museum, it gave the historical period currency. The Guggenheim Museum in New York is a very different environment from the Ethnographic Museum of Hanoi, of course, and Vaughn's exhibition has not attracted the same number or kind of visitor as the museum in Vietnam. But there are similarities in how the two exhibitions bring large historical events into view through fragments. The Bao Cup exhibition prompted memories of a time gone past, not one that was desired, but one that needed to be retold in order to better understand it and its present significance. How it led to the contemporary condition of ordinary people, how history got people where they are now. Ball's exhibition is full of broken bodies, metaphoric and ontological. They can never be whole, but serve to explain the artist's family's history and why they are in Denmark today, reminding us that putting the pieces back together is an endless process of reconstruction. As Rebecca Schneider noted, quote, history is a set of sedimented acts, which are not the historical acts themselves, but the act of security, securing any incident backward, end quote. Instead of transforming the objects that he has excavated from history into precious artifacts, Val has transformed the museum into a site of memory or a giant reliquary, as if the objects in themselves did not suffice to convert the museum into a shrine. He has also intervened in the space in another way. He exposed the oculus, the glass ceiling designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1959, thus revealing the spatial atmosphere of the museum. The oculus is usually covered in fabric, but in exposing it, Vaugh has infused his exhibition with natural light, a rare occurrence in the museum. As a Catholic, Vaugh may be conjuring divine light, but ever mindful of history, his intervention in the museum may be an opportunity for viewers to experience a kind of catharsis, bridging the past with the present. Like the Bao Cup exhibition, Ball's exhibition reveals the complex relations between humans and their history of how objects serve to construct and reconstruct the past and how symbols of death and destruction can be given new life. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. That's fascinating. I have a good number of questions, but I shall hold these for now when I ask everybody else to do the same. Um, until we hear from, from Jad first, and then I ask everybody to, to come up with their questions afterwards. Um, Jad Tho will speak next. Um, she studied art and archaeology of India and Southeast Asia at the Col de Louvre and Vietnamese studies at the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilization. Before she study, started her PhD um, at aix marseille University, where she's currently enrolled and studying with Philippe Le Fayer and with Nora Taylor. She's working there on Vietnamese art and in particular um, on pop propaganda posters and the time period from 1945 till the present day. Today's paper is very much related to that. She will speak on the musealization of the North Vietnamese propaganda poster, consequences of the status and function of the object. Jad, thank you. So I will share my screen. Is it okay? Uh, so thank you for organizing this event. So uh, I will speak about the musealization of the North Vietnamese propaganda poster, the consequences on the statue and the function of the object. Uh, the first North Vietnamese propaganda posters appeared at the beginning of the Indochina War in the, in the 40s, which opposed Vietnam to France. Since that time, posters have been produced by professional painters, amateurs, or even soldiers working for the state communication office, 
These posters are still produced in present day Vietnam, but obviously the conditions in which they are produced, as well as the techniques and themes represented have evolved. So I will first give you a general presentation of the poster so that you can understand the questions around its material definition. From 1945 to 1954, propaganda images were mostly xilographed or lithographed on rice paper. Their format is diverse. They can go from about 20 centimeters to 50 centimeters. They represent figurative scenes inscribed in the present in which the shortcomings of the French enemy highlight in contrast the virtues of the Vietnamese people. The enemy is portrayed in a grotesque way. He's shown in a way to be demonized. The Vietnamese people are represented in the events of daily life, work in the fields, for example, or in the Viet Bac, uh, like in assemblies or meetings. These black and white representations are animated by touches of color, whose palette was quite limited until 1950. They use red, blue, yellow until it diversifies and really intensifies after the war in 1954. The quality of the line varies. It is sometimes naive, sometimes very aesthetic. In these dynamic and varied compositions, the characters all inspired by real life, isolated or numerous, are represented in action. A humorous touch is often present. In 1954, after the government was officially established in Hanoi, poster models intended to be printed were painted with gouache on thick white paper and made more resistant. The formats were larger, up to 70 centimeters. An enlargement of these models was sometimes painted directly on village walls or on panels provided for this purpose in cities. Also, the number of prints was still limited. The automated printing of posters allowed the reproduction of a model on a larger scale. The compositions became simpler, the characters were less numerous, and the landscapes became stereotyped. A real coded language allowing an allegorical discourse is put in place. The future modernity of the country is evoked by cranes, factories, or high-rise buildings in the city, while in the countryside, it's signified by tractors or other machines. The brightly colored posters show close-up images of happy, smiling people looking forward to a future filled with hope. From 1966 until 1986, the Central Propaganda Workshop managed the production of posters, the content of which was adapted to the state's annual political plan. This centralized organization increased the production outputs. Posters of sufficiently high quality were stamped by the workshop to be distributed throughout the country in thousands of copies. The content adapted to the place of distribution celebrates historic, historical events and encourages the war fighters. These posters, whose format became standardized in the 80s, were printed in Hanoi or in provincial printing houses or in China until 1978. As before, the models painted in gouache depict peasants, workers, and laborers in bright and optimistic colors under the emblems of the party. These representations take place in an idealized setting related to the exemplary. The posters are accompanied by a slogan of emulation, which can be composed by the artist, extracted from a poem or a speech by President Ho Chi Minh. In 1986, the Central Propaganda Workshop was dissolved. 
The production of poster is now managed by several ministries that launch national calls for projects during political campaigns. A dozen painters graduates of the Hanoi School of Fine Arts work for the Ministry of Culture and Information in the Propaganda Department. Progressively, the original drawings composing the posters were reworked on the computer. Thus, the characters can be cut out, reused. It is the same for the, um, the symbols, the landscapes, and the slogans. The poster has become an assembly of preconceived forms, quickly realizable, diffused with very great edition, uh, at least 10,000 copies. While preserving their very colored and optimistic aspect representing smiling characters, the topics within to include the plagues of the modern society, like prostitution, AIDS, uh, drugs. So in their context of creation and distribution, what was their role? At first sight, when we consider these posters, the role that seems obvious to us is that of a communication tool. In other words, these posters are produced by the state to communicate a message to the population. In the 40s, the Vietnamese population was 95% illiterate. So communication through images was the best way to spread information to the masses. The vast majority of messages were about the news of the war, whether about the fighting against the enemy, meetings or gatherings of the Viet Minh, or even the back front, the agricultural production used to support the war efforts. These images are therefore informative, informative sorry, in nature, but above all, they make it possible to start spreading the communist ideology and its values, the importance of the peasantry, for example. The posters therefore communicate a message that serves above all to gather, federate, encourage, or stimulate the population while letting the new ideology of power appear. After 1954, when the government of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam officially settled in Hanoi, these posters, uh, whose mock-ups were painted with gouache, broadcast the political plane of the states. Obviously, between 1964 and 1975, during the war against the United States, a large quantity of posters on the war were produced. The subjects were targeted, for example, on the production, the same posters wouldn't have been produced in the coastal provinces as in the mountains. But in addition to this, a number of them were aimed at building the new republic. History, according to the party, is disseminated. The Viet Minh victories are celebrated, as well as the great historical figures both the martyrs and, and those in power, such as Ho Chi Minh. Through selected symbols, uh, the ideology of this new republic invaded the sets. They completely integrated the visual references of the population, so much so that in the 80s, some posters were no longer narrative. They no longer included characters, landscapes, but simply symbols on a plain background. The informative character of the, of the poster is not present anymore, but it always has a function of emulation and gathering, which is expressed not so much by the designation of a common enemy, but rather by, by the creation of a common history. In any case, whatever the, the objectives of these posters, we understand that originally they were created to communicate at a moment in time. They are intimately connected to the context of the moment and have not been made to be preserved over the long term. Placed back in the context of creation, they are everyday objects with an ephemeral character, which weren't considered as art at all. Yet, perhaps because they are a communication tool that uses images, 
or perhaps because they were handmade by artists, this tension between everyday objects and artistic work has been present since their appearance. At that time, in the 40s, a debate between the representatives of the authority and the artist Tom Oppen, a painter who graduated from the Indochina School of Fine Arts and specialized in romantic oil painting, opened up in the press of the time, particularly in the periodical Vanier. Two visions were opposed, the Marxist-Leninist vision according to which there is no separation between arts and propaganda, since all arts act in favor of an ideology, whatever it is, and the vision of the artist for whom painting must be the ex expression of individuality. This confusion over the material definition of the object is still present today. We will now see in what and how the entry of posters in museums has changed the meaning of this object. Despite the inherent ephemeral nature of these posters during the creation and distribution, some of them were eventually preserved and integrated into public and private museum collections. In the 90s, these posters began to be pursued by private collectors who bought them directly from the, the painters, as well as by museums, which collected them thanks to donations from the painters or from state services. The painters had kept both painted and printed posters, while the state services had kept printed posters. These posters were therefore selected to integrate these collections and to be classified, preserved, documented, and presented. So the question is why were they preserved? And does this process of museumization, the fact that the object enters the museum, change the original meaning of the object? By entering the museum, the object loses all the information related to its original context of use, but acquires new functions. Indeed, one doesn't know anymore where these posters were kept or for how long. If one considers that an object is defined by the perception that one has of it, in fact, these posters entry into art museums call into question its material definition. The selection of the object by art museums, the way in which the object is presented in text or in its staging, conditions the perception that the visitor will have of the object and thus its definition. Several museums in Vietnam and abroad possess a collection of North Vietnamese propaganda posters. For Vietnamese museums, we will refer to the collections of the Museum of the Revolution, the Ho Chi Minh Museum, the Women's Museum and the Hanoi Museum of Fine Arts to illustrate our points. As far as foreign museums are concerned, we will use the National Gallery of Singapore and the National University of Singapore Museum as examples. So why were these objects eventually preserved and collected today? Inevitably, for each of the collections mentioned above, the historical character of the object, that which gives a representation of the reality of a past time, is always one of the motivations for these collections. Posters can be used to complement the message given by archival documents and objects testifying to certain historical events in the country, as is the case at the Hanoi Revolution Museum, or to illustrate the role played by women in the history of Vietnam at the Hanoi Women's Museum, for example. Uh, and so have these objects become art objects by entering certain institutions and collections? The fact that these posters are exhibited in art museums 
such as the Hanoi Museum of Fine Arts or the National Gallery of Singapore necessarily conditions their receptions. At the Fine Arts Museum, an entire room is dedicated to them, while at the National Gallery of Singapore, the postures are displayed in a room devoted to a specific moments in the Vietnamese art history as examples of visual culture. Yet, although they are presented in a specific space, they are therefore among the fine arts collections. Both museums, being museums of fine arts, demonstrates that a particular attention was given to the visual characteristics during the selection. Being in a space devoted to works of art, the artistic character of these posters can only be emphasized in the reception that the visitor will have. In addition to the discourse proposed by the exhibition spaces, the discourse of the institutions tends today to show these posters as artistic objects. For example, in NUS Museum exhibition, curator and art historian Sung Yun Wen chose to use the drawings and posters as well as text written in the same context to focus on the individual experience and agency of the artist by focusing on their creativity in response to the war. Finally, in the exhibition catalogues of the Hanoi Fine Art Museum, the Revolutionary Museum and the Ho Chi Minh Museum, the propaganda poster is described as a work of art defined uh, as belonging to a new art form whose expansion was promoted by the revolution as part of the revolutionary arts. Moreover, for the inauguration of the exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts, the institution didn't want the political aspect to take precedence over the artistic aspect and was particularly attentive to the translation of the title of the exhibition into English and finally chose Vietnamese posters in order to avoid the world propaganda. So finally, the museumization of the North Vietnamese propaganda posters has provided the ephemeral everyday object with a perennial patrimonial character. Through this process, the tension between a political tool and artistic object present since the apparition of the posters hasn't only been reactivated, but has also upset the balance between these two components. Indeed, the artistic aspect, which is very little present in the reception in context, takes a more important place within the museum institution. Beyond the artistic aspect, the musealization of the posters also transforms the temporality of the discourse. Indeed, old posters are reused for propaganda purposes during certain exhibitions whose aim is to commemorate a historical event. This is the case, for example, of the exhibition organized at the Ho Chi Minh Museum in Hanoi in 2019, which commemorated the 50th anniversary of the death of Ho Chi Minh. On the occasion of this event, the posters collected hadn't left their original function, which was to exalt the qualities and merits of the presidents. They were grouped thematically according to, the, according to Ho Chi Minh's attributes, the hero of national liberation, the soul of the Vietnamese nation, the, mil the military leader and the poet. So thank you. Thank you, Charter. It was fascinating to see so many different examples and so nice to see how you and Nora connect by talking about the museum context into which these everyday objects or, or posters that are not meant to, that were not made or meant for the museum are shown. And um, may I uh, maybe start with a question for Nora. Um, Nora, could you say a little bit more about the reception of both work, um, both 
back in his own culture, so to speak, vis-a-vis uh, -vis his exhibition in New York City. Are there in the in the media or in the press, are there, there reactions that differ from one another that maybe one culture sees him differently from the other? Uh, that's a good question because he has not exhibited in Vietnam. He exhibited in Denmark where he grew up and then in the US. I mean, he is um, by all accounts, a kind of global art superstar because he's, he's exhibited in Venice several times. He's uh, exhibited in Singapore in uh, Mexico. Uh, so he's, he's um, world known everywhere except Vietnam. <laughs> But um, I think that the people I talked to, so this is very anecdotal because I'm not sure I've read any articles about him, but the artists that I know in Vietnam are a little bit baffled by uh, his fame considering that he doesn't make uh, his works. He just finds them or acquires them. Um, but there are a few young artists. He, he went to Vietnam, he goes to Vietnam regularly and he hired a young Vietnamese um, artist to be his research assistant who found one of the churches that he dismantled and brought to Venice, for instance. And so that, that attracted the attention of the younger generation, but the older generation just don't understand. So. Thank you so much. Um, in in the sh in the chat, there's one question I think for Jad um, about the artistic training of the poster painters um, in in Vietnam. Um, Rimi Jariok asked the question. He makes reference to to China. But Chad, could you say a little bit more, maybe about the painters where they are known? Um, so the the first generation of painters, um, I mean the ones um, who had an education in high school, uh, were trained in um, the in the China School of Fine Arts. Um, then, uh, between the two worlds, a lot of uh, painters um, were sent to study in the uh, USSR. I think um, there is also painters who were sent to study in China, but uh, now I, I couldn't find some I couldn't find real evidences, so yeah. And then uh, it was still painters um, who were trained in the uh, Hanoi School of Fine Arts. But they were also um, training uh, in, the, in the Viet Bac. I mean, the, the painters who were trained uh, um, at the Indochina School of Fine Arts um, gave uh, art courses to other people. Um, yes, for the painters who had education, I think it's, it's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Obviously, there are different generations. I mean, you're describing um, several decades and very different um, stylistic features also in the posters, different sizes, different colors, no color, and so on. So we're dealing with a, a, a larger community and very differently trained artists. May I invite other questions? Uh, maybe you can um, show your, your, yourselves and, and raise a question. Thank you. Oscar. Oh, I have so many questions. Um, uh, Nora, uh, at the slide where you showed the photos of the chandelier in, from 1990, 1973 and the one taken in 2009, I believe, or 2012, or, or two dates, it seemed like the size that, that they had shrunk. It seems that were not the same size. So uh, it, I'm not sure whether it's true or whether he had 
somehow work with them, um, which would be typically typically uh, young people, I would I would think. So it's a, it's a very practical or, or a factual question. The other is about um, he, you say that he turns the museum into a shrine of memory, but in my view, any museum is a shrine of memory. Memory materialized in objects and then explained again uh, in all sorts of ways. And even for contemporary art, that's the heritage of the future, if you will, right? If you do it right. Um, so um, I also have two questions or at least one question for, for Jad, but I don't want to. Yeah, thank you for that, Oscar. Um, I'll go backwards. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course the, uh, MoMA is a temple and so forth. There are all kinds of associations you can make between you know, the, what is exactly the museum. And I think that um, Va is very conscious of where he's placing his objects that have this historical significance, you know, that he's putting them against the white walls or on the floors of the Guggenheim, you know, knowing that they're, um, uh, you know, that he's placing them in that context. But it, it's, uh, and so he plays with that a little bit. Um, it's not to say that he, it removes the historical significance of the objects, but it also doesn't mean that it gives it more historical significance. I think I liked um, Jad, where my paper is similar to Jad's is this idea that um, suddenly a work, an object that might have historical significance becomes, you know, aestheticized or, or put on display to be interpreted aesthetically. And no, you know, therefore the other, I mean, what I was trying to say is that some of the other qualities or attributes of these objects can only be discerned by people like us who know Vietnamese history, let's say other people would not, you know, point, see those. Um, as for the chandelier, yeah, he he picked pick them apart. You're right that he's he's shrunk. They shrunk. He's he's also commodified. I mean, one thing I didn't mention, but you would be interested in, is, of course, these are all commodities for him. Money making. I mean, he's very shrewd at how he's making money off of this because he's reselling. He bought the chandeliers, but he resells them piecemeal and fragments and. So he conceals a little bit of the original uh, scale of it and probably re put them together in a different way, you know, dismantled and, and piece them together. So I think, you know, he's made, he's stretched them. They go a long way. <laughs> uh, he's made them last longer and turned them into multiple objects. But Like cutting up the, the uh, Statue of Liberty. Yeah, exactly. Oscar, do you want to ask your question um, to Jad as well? If if not, we go on. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, by the way, for really brilliant presentations. Uh, yeah, my question is that basically your analysis seems is focusing very much on function and function is always linked up with context function is always in context if you see what i mean so changing context and therefore changing function and whatnot but there are other possibilities analytical possibilities um, and one that st struck me is the the question of whether there was any formal or stylistic influence from china I mean, you know, in the one of the first slides, the 1945-54 period, uh, there were uh, posters also with uh, Chinese characters. Um, and uh, 1954, independent, North Vietnam, suddenly they start to resemble the posters very much the Chinese propaganda posters with happy, shiny people, etc., in stylized landscapes. Um, and it, that all stops in 1978, again, for political reasons, right? So I wonder whether you, you don't draw the, the borders too, uh, too, too tightly closed, as it were. 
uh, in terms of the um, artistic developments. Um, actually, during the first war, uh, there were also uh, Chinese trainers in the, in the Viet Bac, so so that's right. There is quite a, a lot of posters who um, where well, there is a like Chinese character written on on them. Um, I think the yeah. In the drawings, there is um, there are similarities, like the iconography and the smiling characters and things like that. But I was quite surprised because when I had a deeper look uh, at those posters, finally I I found out that they they were quite different. Uh, still quite different. So I think, yes, um, if we look at the styles, we can we can identify um, similarities and we can connect the two the two countries. But um, I was surprised because uh, it was more different that that's what I thought. Uh, before starting to analyze them. So I, I will uh, I will go deeper in my uh, PhD thesis with that mm -hmm. because I'm still uh, building my database <laughs> and uh, I will analyze uh, that uh, more precisely. But uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, more different than that, that what we, we think. Can I just add something? It's interesting because I, I know a lot of the artists who um, drew th stamps and currency and other things at that time, and there is there was China, there were Chinese characters on the currency as well, right? Right at the beginning. So I don't know if it necessarily has to do with the artists who were there or if it was um for another purpose of audience or uh, leftover from colonial period or something like that but it could be printed in china uh i think the yeah uh, there is a uh, quite a, a lot of posters who had been printed in in china for sure but there is also uh, i i could find uh, some documents in the archives in france and um, I think there is also poster who were printed in uh, in Vietnam, but written with Chinese characters, and because they they needed the the Chinese population. So, um, Chad, do you know if the Chinese characters were referring to Chu Nom? Um, uh, it's complicated for me because I, I don't know how to read the, the Hanum, but I think it was, uh, it was not uh, in Hanum because um, finally the Nom was not um, read, read by a lot of people. So I think to, to speak to the most uh, numerous uh, people, you need to write in a, uh, maybe Mandarin character. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was gnome. There is gnome on the um, popular images, but I don't think the, the, the inscriptions on the popular images uh, was written to be, to be read. I think it's, it was more like um, a tradition, but I don't think the posters was, uh, were written in Hanum. And may I ask one more question about the, the nice um, exhibitions in Hanoi and Singapore that you refer to? Uh, were all of these um, shorter temporary displays and in, in some cases you said referring to anniversaries or are there also longer term displays that just um, sort of 
give even more gravitas to the medium by by having a gallery devoted to these posters or something like that? In Singapore, it's the um, permanent exhibition. Um, the one in the National Gallery, it's the permanent exhibition. The one in the NUS Museum, it's temporary display. Um, at the Fine Arts Museum in Hanoi, uh, I think it's a, it will be a permanent exhibition because there is no date, I think, on the poster. But I'm not sure because it was um, it opened last year, and uh, so I'm I'm not sure it will stay or, or not. It is remarkable, though, that these exhibitions are on for so long. I I like to see that it it gives a lot more weight to the medium. Are there any other questions? Hi, um, may I ask if um, the genome that you talked about? earlier, was it in the Chinese propaganda art or in the Vietnamese one? Because as I, as my understanding, the characters on the Vietnamese propaganda art is, um, they are like, they're written in uh, Latin characters, which is like the later Vietnamese languages. Um, so no, um, there is like a tract written in the uh, in Chinese character, but uh, it was in Vietnam, and so there is also Chinese posters. Oh, Chinese posters! Sorry, Vietnamese posters uh, who were written uh, with Chinese character, but I don't think it was a genome. I think it's uh, Mandarin or yeah true i i because i think so too i i didn't really like know the language but i know that genome is like a composition between them yeah but on the popular images uh it's known oh thank you are there are the yes Oh, no, I just want to clarify that is if you're familiar with the Dongho prints, those are written with gnome, but the propaganda posters, if they had Chinese, it would be Han characters, not gnome. Thank you. Are there additional questions or comments? If not, then I will represent the, the crowd tonight and thank Nora Taylor and Toad Gun very, very, um, with a very heartfelt thank you for your, both your presentations um, and the many questions that resulted from them and comments. A very good presentation and a good discussion. Thank you both very, very much. <laughs>